Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Artists of Color. I'm Elaine Hall Corbin, your host, and I'm here today because it's a wonderful day, and I'm so glad to be back on the set. And today, I want to introduce everyone to my guest, Anthony W. Lanier, who is an amazing photographer and sketch artist, which I didn't know about until I started seeing all your sketches on Facebook. Anthony, thank you for being with me today. Elaine, thank you for inviting me to be on the show. Oh, you know, you and I have known each other a little bit. But when I got to reading your bio, I realized you were a transplant. You weren't, <laughs> original, you weren't originally a Bostonian or a Roxbury person. I try tell to blend us, in. I, you, do, you do very well at that. So tell us a little bit about you. Tell me where you're from and how you got from where you're from to here. Originally, I'm from Kentucky, and I had lived there most of my life up until maybe two years after I got out of college. And so I was working at the newspaper in Louisville, and I got a job offer to come to New England okay. and at a work at a newspaper on the South Shore of Boston. So I took the offer, and I came here, and I've been here for 31 years. Long time. Long time. How did you... When you, what was the name of the newspaper that you were working for in the South, in the South Shore? The Patriot Ledger. I was the graphics that. editor. I've heard, I've heard that. Only I actually didn't know it was in the South Shore. I thought it was like um, Boston South End, uh, not South End, but Boston, uh, South, South Boston, that area. Its circulation area was actually from Quincy down to the Cape. Oh, okay. So uh, there was another set of papers that the, the parent company actually owned that were Cape Cod newspapers, but the area in between the Cape and uh, south of Boston, once you crossed uh, over the Four River, was pretty much the Patriot Ledger circulation area. They called it Ledgerland. Ledgerland, okay. Never heard any of that. <laughs> Interesting. How did you get in, first of all, how did you get into photography. Tell us a little bit about your background. I've always been what I call an image maker. Okay. Uh, as a child, obviously, I was an artist and you draw. A lot of times uh, I was, I think I was given a camera as a Christmas gift or something like that. And occasionally I would just take pictures just as a memento because I would be the one person that said, <laughs> Well, one day these are going to be worth a lot of money, money. <laughs> and then somebody would be able to look back at them and, and be able to tell what happened at the event because I would be the one person that would be taking photos, especially wow. at family events. Right, exactly. And I evolved that into taking pictures <laughs> everywhere else I went. Mm. Okay, okay. But the sneaky little secret. Uh-uh, what's the sneaky little secret? The sneaky little secret was I was making prints from the, the photos I was taking and using them to draw from. Now, nobody, and that's why you didn't know that. Ah, uh, see? And so that's one of the things that, it wasn't like I did it for myself. I exhibited in different shows. It's just a lot of people just saw me as a person who's carrying a camera, camera. and taking pictures in their face all the time. And they're always asking the question, well, what is he doing with these photos he's taking? And, but nobody ever asked me. They would be talking out just, loud. Just talk. So I never answered the question for them either. So, and I continue to do this. And this is what, uh, well, we're not talking about the book yet, but that's what it evolved into. Is, okay, we're going to get to the book because we'll I want to ask you, when, when you started your photography and then you transferred over into doing sketches, turning those photographs into sketches, why, what made you want to do that? We're going to have to back up again. Okay. I have always Been taken an photos and used them to draw oh, from. Oh, to draw from. Okay. Right. The work that we're going to talk about that became the book okay. is really the idea because of the pandemic. Right. Oh, okay. Everything started to look alike because I'm drawing people who are wearing masks. But before that, I had always drawn people 
from photos I had taken because, for one, I would use them uh, at my job, and I thought that was a way to increase my skill. Right. But I also considered myself a fine artist. So when I was in college, one of my teachers was telling me that you can't serve two masters. Master. Oh, so yeah. if you wanted to be a fine artist, you had to devote your career to that. But you couldn't be a commercial artist and work for someone else and do graphic design or possibly illustration at that. Yes. So you needed to be true to your craft the way he said it. Today, that is not true. No, it isn't. So any person that creates images, you can do any way, anything you mm -hmm. want. You That's can true. Do um, there's a friend of mine who is an artist, but he's all, another person who's an artist, but also is an, is, an, is an image maker, but also does photography. Exactly. You know, um, and you might know him. His name is Arnie Cheatham. Yes. You know, and he's, he's a musician. Right. But he's also an artist, and, he, and he's also an image maker. Yes. Yeah. When you started, Let's, let's get right into the book. I really want to get into the book because I was surprised when I saw that you had done this work and now you were putting it into a book. So was everybody else. <laughs> what made you want to, what made you want to take the images, the photographs that you took around the pandemic? Was there something about the issue of the pandemic that made you want to take certain photos, make, um, make images of them, sketch images of them, and put them into a book? What I wanted to do was to organize a group of pictures with a theme that I liked. Okay. And the theme is the poor, the challenged, the people on the street, the, the neglected, okay. the people we avoid, okay. the panhandlers, the street musicians, the amputated, the blind. These are people who move around on the street, and for the most part, we recognize them, but we don't interact, interact with, them with them because we Which see them. And I thought I would do something that as an artist, you're always trying to break new ground, right. uh, put together a body of work that showed the people that don't get a lot of attention. Yes. And the p pandemic really brought that to the forefront because they struggle possibly more than we, we do, do surviving. Exactly true. Uh, when I ride the subway, I know that the street musicians I don't know how well they do, right? but I always try to help them out some kind of way financially because we're all artists and some of us struggle. I keep my struggle to myself, but True. I and use that to challenge myself creatively. Yes. Uh, I haven't really missed any meals and I have a place to stay, but I do, try do to they? empathize with, with their them. situation. Exactly. And so when I go out, let's say on a daily situation, even today, I'm looking for someone to add to this portfolio that I've already created in the book. Okay. And what else is new out there that I haven't seen? seen. Uh, there's a variety of people in the book. There are people who have challenges, physical challenges, and then there challenges. are people who look like they're having a the time of their life. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then there are those that you see and they might not have anything to eat. They and I'm trying to show that because by, the book, when you look at it in total, is to get to you emotionally. Okay. It's a fun book. Uh, some of the images are entertaining but what but, they talk about. But it shows but it, what to give it that whole life range. is going, how life is going right. for those people during this particular time. Exactly. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. 
So one of the things that I wanted to do is, I'm not trying to take a lot of credit, but I've gone to some exhibits and I've looked at a lot of work online of other artists. And I don't see other artists talking about the pandemic. pandemic. That's, and that was what funny, because that's what really got me, your title. And then I'm saying, he's actually, he's focusing on what's going on, how people are surviving during this time. And like you said, you don't see anyone. I've never, you're the first one. Other that artists I'm, are talking about Life or in general. Or continuing the series that they were doing. Doing in the beginning. Two or three years ago. They haven't changed it. It's, this is what my theme is, and I'm still on it. And I'm I said, sticking to it. We've got one of the biggest life-changing situations happening to us now, and no one has actually stopped in their tracks and said, I'm completely changing what I'm doing, and I'm going to work on a pandemic theme. theme. COVID-19 has just overwhelmed me, and I'm going to pour my emotion into, into that. this creative project. I have not seen that. No, I keep I haven't looking either. for it, but I haven't seen it. Yes. Maybe nationally, but not locally. Not locally. No, like I said, you are with me. You're the first one. And I'm not trying to say I'm being really clever. It's just no, that I, I thought the idea, the only way you can really talk about how the pandemic exists is to draw people in masks. And someone was saying, well, you know, after a while, after you've drawn a few, if not a few dozen, the, you got it. And I said, you'd be amazed. The different There's images you can see. There's always something else you couldn't get yes. that shows up on another day. That's right. That's true. Like I, the one Juneteenth. <laughs> where, where was that? Where? Oh, the the, the, the woman. The drawing with the flower dress. Yes. Well, there we go. Yes. So she was at the Juneteenth event. And to me, she was sort of like the culmination individual that I saw there mm -hmm. because she seemed irritated that I'd taken her photo and because she was talking to her mother uh -huh. about I had done this. So I was a little apprehensive, <laughs> but I still kept doing it. I knew. <laughs> See? I and see. so I was trying to find the right look because you can create it and craft it in a drawing, but if you have it, there's not more altering that you have you to, do. to do. You just have to make a few adjustments because I always adjust fingers and arms a little bit to get things to just get right. So, just right. Right. And I always like to draw fingers because if you want to show yourself really clever as an artist, drawing fingers and toes are, are always something to show that you really have mastered anatomy. Oh, okay. A lot of artists can cover that up, but once you see a person draw fingers and hands and toes, you know, they're really looking at a, at a figure and not just guessing at it. Oh, all right. So back to her. And the dress was actually green, but oh. the flowers were white. Oh. So I said if I did it in graphite, it really, it's you don't really to... lose that much in, in, in trying to say, well, what did it look like if it was in color? Right. Because that's the reason why I work in graphite is because graphite is a way to make a statement. It's like artists do black and white, white photos. photos. So what I'm trying to get you to do, and that's a great drawing to me in doing that because it's so much black in it because I'm using a really hard pencil. Oh, okay. So to get the black that you see in that drawing, you really have to keep going over and, and over. over and over the same area because I don't smear with my finger and oh, I don't, don't use a tool to do it either. So when things get really black, it's because I'm using a really hard pencil over and over again, and it builds up the tone a lot more even. Oh, okay. All right, that was... Artist secret. Okay, that's <laughs> artist secret. We're not telling anybody. That was, I, I was, I said, wow, Juneteenth. I thought that was quite interesting. I well, she had her hair that's sort of like in the natty, Afro, Afro. Uh, dread. Oh yeah, you could see it. I could right. see it. And so she had that look where she's sort of not posing, but she's looking off. off. And I, I said, this is the way I see Juneteenth happening is. It's a big attraction. It's uh, 
interesting to be there because there's so many people that so show up. So many people. Variety, and you can get lost in it. And yes. so she was the person to me of the fraternity and sorority groups that were there, the families. Yes. All the other people that show up that said, this is the event simplified. Mm -hmm. Someone that had a colorful outfit, everybody tries to stand out. Don't they, they do. And she they was do. it. Uh, I, I liked it. I well, liked thank it. You. And there was, there was another one. I can't remember. There was another one about... Um, the I got a bargain. Regiment. Oh, I got a bargain. <laughs> so I, right. <sighs> that actually happened in Upham's Corner. Oh. Because I remember exactly where all the drawings were made. So she was waiting for the bus this person was. I originally had done the drawing in graphite, and it was in 11 by 14 size, and I had it in a health center exhibit. Oh. Uh, years ago, uh, possibly 15, and someone liked my drawing so much that they decided they should keep it. <laughs> and they took it? From the health center. What? And so, but since I like the, the idea of it, because that obviously is the, what would you call it, the, the quote of the store that doesn't exist in Boston anymore, of Fowling's Basement. Oh, yes. So they had the colorful that bag. That is a quote. Right. The bag was uh, white with the uh, black and red lettering on it. Yep. So I didn't want to do the words where you could read it, but I said, that's the story. That's the story. That's the story. So I had to painstakingly, I didn't paint the letters. I went and painted around the white space to create the lettering. Oh, wow. <laughs> now that's an interesting technique. Right. So now the, I gotta look. The type is white, and yeah. so I could have painted them on a black surface, but I actually went and colored around the white space, and and, and left the lettering there. Wow. So it took a little effort to do it that way, and that's these an are, interesting technique, though. These are supposed to be drawings that are impressionistic and done in a day, so that. Called a little for a little cheating uh -huh. because it did take more time to put that together. <laughs> but you did it, and right. it, and it's I liked it. Well, I really you. liked it. But that was the idea behind each one of the drawings too. That since we brought up the book, the premise for the book in the beginning was is I would create a drawing a day, no matter what the cause was. Is that I needed to get it done. So if I got a drawing done in a couple of hours. I could move on. Right. And so anything that got too extensive, I needed to figure out a way to wrap it up before I went to bed. Okay. Sometimes that didn't work. And then if you look at a drawing the next day, you're going to go, I can't believe you're still doing that. <laughs> and you're going to have to fix something. But uh, for the most part, they were a day. Because what most people don't know and what you don't know is for the book, I went through over a thousand drawings. Over a thousand drawings? The, there's a thousand drawings that I went through to reduce them down. I don't remember exactly what the number is in a book, but there may be a, at least a hundred yeah, and about ten. A hundred, yes. A hundred and five and ten. And ten. Somewhere maybe in there. Twelve to a hundred and fifteen, maybe. Okay. So to reduce it down to that number, so for every drawing you see, there was 10 that got eliminated. See? Wow. That's amazing. That is really amazing. I want to talk about all of your, all, every one of the pieces that I saw. This one on the front cover of the book. There, I can't rem there was, I don't remember, I don't even think there's a name. Dancer the at the MFA. D Okay, Boston. see, you remember because you did I, the work. I, I did the title for every one of them. So now, tell me about dancing with the MFA. Did you want to hold the book? We might as well. Well, you might as well hold the book. So, dancer at the MFA Boston is 
there's a story, obviously, for most of the drawings. On Martin Luther King Day open house at the MFA, so I took my two children that were still at the house, and we went to the MFA. And we knew there was supposed to be entertainment on that day because it's free admission. So right. there's normally activities for you to be involved. So we went to the courtyard, and this woman who was in a wheelchair was dancing. And we had seen her uh, the previous year. Oh. So I knew that she usually moved around in the wheelchair and sort of did some physical movement that was dance. Okay. So I never knew that. This open house, which was uh, three years ago, I believe, she got out of the wheelchair and she proceeded to do some standing movements and then some things like the pose on the cover on the floor. And I was really shocked because I yeah. thought she was limited to limited the wheelchair. Limited to just the wheelchair. So I proceeded to look like I was the anomaly at this event where there were several hundred people watching in the courtyard. And so I'm laying on my back on the floor, taking Take photos with my phone, oh. looking up at her. And everybody else is like, like is look, he the event or well, she, she the event? <laughs> See? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so because I wanted to get like a really good shot of what she was doing, because I knew I was going to do something from it. And that was one of the poses. And I believe I had done maybe six. Okay. And that was the one I liked best. Best. I love that best. That is cool. That is absolutely phenomenal. I love that. Yeah, and the, the trick to, to some of these drawings, what most people don't realize is that I try to limit erasing. So oh, wow. when you look at the drawing, I'm trying to give you the impression that I was actually there doing the drawing, but that doesn't really work out because some of these, the time doesn't allow you to do something like that. I couldn't get her to stand still and then I'd have oh, to do no. the pose for memory. So it really doesn't work out. So the, the trick is when you do a drawing and you want to create that energy of what you saw, you know, it's exciting to watch and she's moving Ooh, around. Yeah. And I'm trying to give you the sense from the drawing technique that it was an emotional and moving experience from looking at the drawing. I'm trying to get you to sense that. That's why I draw that way. Uh-huh. I love the way your drawings are so powerful because you, if any, well, like me, when I look at, when I look at a drawing like yours, I'm seeing more into it than, I'm seeing, I'm seeing what's there. Right. I'm seeing what, trying to see what, what you saw, the move, like you said, the movement, right. you know, and picking up the emotional part. For instance, Mel, in the, on the bench. Yeah. Yes. Tell me about him. Tell me about that. Not that I don't know Uncle Mel. <laughs> so the story with Mel was, I was walking around in the South End. And I usually, I just want to walk by the area where I know he lives. I've never been in his house. Oh, you have But I know where he lives at. OK. And so there is a bench that's at the, South End Technology Center that he yes. found it. So there's a bench, I guess it's called <laughs> Mel's Bench. And I had seen him sitting there before. And so just as a memory, I said, I would just walk by as I'm cutting through the South End. And I have rounded the corner at Dartmouth onto um, Columbus? Uh, Tremont, oh, or Tremont. Columbus. Yeah, Columbus. And he was sitting there. And I said, oh my God, because weeks ago, his family had announced that Mel needs to rest and he yes. can't be doing a lot of public, public events, events exactly. because he needs to just be more aware of his health. Yes. And I, that was the last thing I expected was to see him out there. And I said it was a bright, it was a nice day. It was, it was easily 80 degrees and it was a nice clear day. And so he was out there just enjoying himself and taking in the sun. And I said, wow. oh my God, Mel, I didn't expect to Next, see I you didn't here. expect to see you. And he's like, I, you know, it's like the look of like, I've seen you, but I don't even know your name. And I like, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so we, we just had a little light conversation. Then I asked him, uh, one of the rare times I would, I said, could I take your photo? And that, I used that for the drawing because I, to me that was the way I know Mel King best. Yes. Is he's like the South End, but certainly even a citywide anchor who's yeah. there. Yeah, And absolutely. that was the way I wanted to show him as somebody who's there. There. You know, he doesn't have to be with a family or a crowd, but he yes. certainly uh, can yeah. be where he is all by himself and be I, present. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I adopted him when I was a little girl. But I actually met, uh, met Mel King, just to add, during the Million Man March. I mean, I had heard of him, but I had never met him. So oh, really? in 1995, mm. uh, yep. after the march was over, they organized certain neighborhood committees. Yes, they did. To spearhead some of the uh, points that were made during the march that we would put into place locally in Boston. Boston. And he was uh, one of the leaders doing presentation. And so I went there and, of course, I took photos. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> What, I want to stop here for a minute and ask this question. What made you want to, do, what made you want to put this book together? I have a cousin who had done two books here in the last five years. A teenage friend has just published two books in possibly the last three years also. And I'm aware of this from Facebook. But my cousin's uh, first book, I did the cover for it. I did the illustration. Mm. Uh, so these ideas I have been chasing around in my head before they were even doing this. I always thought I should do a book. I thought that was the way you would make yourself well known. No. <laughs> And I didn't understand the dynamics of how to get a publisher to sell an idea. I said, you had to have something really good to do. And uh, I considered that maybe in the spring of this year, okay. I could do a book. But I tried to figure out how would I do it. How would you so do what it? I decided to do was to use the publisher of the friend I knew when I was a teenager. Uh, I contacted his publisher, who was in Indianapolis, Danola Burton. And she has this company called Enhanced DNA Publishing. Ah, uh, oh, so that's where that came from. Okay. Right. So she like has Enhanced DNA Publishing. And I didn't know wh what the process was and what a publisher decided. I thought maybe I needed to sell the idea. But I think pretty much if it looked like something that she could make money off of, <laughs> she would help you to, to bring it to market. <laughs> and that okay. was the way I approached it. And so I pitched the idea, and we, she had never done a book with images only. So she's working with fiction writers for the most part, or oh, okay. for people that are telling some life-moving event stories. Stories, yep. So she wasn't used to just doing a book without uh, words. And I said, well, I understand that because I used to work at a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so... I can cover the end of what should be written and what should be in the book. I said, I will look at my work and I, if I have to, I will edit it down, which is what I just explained with the thousand plus drawings. Yep, you wrote it. So I do that really well because that's what I did that's in my job. Exactly. And it's not a great thing to have to do it with your own work, but that's what I did. And I think I understood what I needed to show in the book. So the drawings that you see compared to the ones that are not in the book, these are the best ones that needed to be shown. Now, there are possibly better drawings, I was, so that but they're says, along the same theme, theme of something else is what the issue is. So I don't want to continue doing uh, what is the black male figure doing on the streets of Boston. So I picked what I thought was that covered a theme that I wanted to show mm -hmm. and the ones that I did not choose, they just cover a range. Of themes? They, they cover the range of things we know exist, but I don't have to keep 
showing the, the really the thing of the struggle or doesn't have the act together. Or, okay, uh, I understand I'm just that. out here just trying right. to make it. So I didn't want to keep, keep doing, doing that, that because we're better than that. You know, black men have a, a lot of variety going on. We have struggles just like anyone else. And I wanted it's to true. show the things that said that I know where you want to go if you're looking at this book, what you believe should be here, but I'm going to give you a broader range of the black male. Beautiful. Then I cover every, every other, I cover the white male, the white female, I cover uh, yeah, a lot of uh, groups. Say, and and yeah. I'm still adding to that story also. Okay. That, that is, I think, the hidden secret that shocks most people that look at the book. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to this, so I'll, I'll volunteer this story where when I look at, I know I'm black. Right. But I have never been the artist who did black work. Now that's shocking to people. Well, some people that know me, said, you know, I, that surprised me. But I've always, and that was true in my job because I'm one of the few people that most people get to know that I've always worked as an artist. Okay. I was never a teacher. I never wanted to teach. I had opportunities to do it. But so I you've said, always been an artist. I always wanted to be an artist. I said, well, if you're producing, the that's work. as good as teaching because if I talk to some child and they're like, well, what do you do? You know, I can show them something I've had exactly. published. And this is not something that I'm talking about some artist, of, another artist in a book. And we're talking about my work. Your work. And so um, I have to know I don't have to think about it. I have to know how to draw anybody. True. For, for jobs I would have. I, I can't sit there. I'm not going to be the person at anybody's job who just does the black people. I would refuse that. Okay. You want to be able to do everybody. Anything. If you want a fruit display. <laughs> a fruit display. If you want a Thanksgiving <laughs> turkey. If okay. you want a black witch for Halloween or a witch that looks like anything. If you want anything drawn, that's what I would do. And that's what I essentially did as an uh, artist at the, for the features department at the newspaper, uh, the Patriot Ledger. Ledger. Okay. So a lot, of a, a lot of stories, half of the stories would come in that they wanted to put into the paper that would be the lead story. Well, they would just literally come to me and say, well, Tony, we have no art. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's not a problem. So if we're talking about grilling fish, Thai food. We, uh, so you would just take the story, and it's, or it's in written form. Right. But they need art to go with the story. You would just create the art. At work without, yes. from my memory. Wow. Because I, there's no, um, I mean, obviously in the time I'm working, this is 20 years ago, there wasn't as much internet searching that you would go on and look for sure. samples of things. I know what fish looks like. And That's true. I know what a turkey looks like. Um, and if we're doing travel things, I've looked at enough travel sections in other newspapers to get a sense of what people would like to see if they went somewhere and how to entice someone to want to go somewhere. And so you just want to take these themes and give it a local flavor, flavor. for the South Shore of Boston. And that's what I did. Oh, wow. Okay. Isn't, that's amazing. That is like, with this book, figure it out. What made you come up with that title? <laughs> Fig, figure it out. If you're in my house, most of the conversations that happen, I'm doing double speak. Double speak? Well, you know what? <laughs> Let's start right there. We are going to go for a break, and you're going to come back and you're going to tell me what double speak is. <laughs> Absolutely. And how that title came to be. Right. So, everyone, wait, we will be right back momentarily. 
As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. Hi. Um, can I get the now bar, please? No problem. One dollar. Have a good one. Got it. Hi, can I get a now bar, please? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. One dollar. Thanks. Hey, what's going on? Hey. Hey, uh, let me get a now bar. Sure. One dollar. Appreciate you. You got it. How's it going? Can I get a now bar? Good afternoon, I'm Elaine Hall Corbin, your host, and welcome back to Artists of Color. And again, I'm so glad to be back. Today, again, my guest is Anthony W. Lanier, author, photographer, sketch artist. Anthony, you know, I've, we've been having a great time. We have. Yes, we have. <laughs> and I want to go back to that phrase that you mentioned about the, the talking, Figured it out. Figured, yes, I want to know about Figured It Out. Figured It Out is where I am now from where I started in my childhood. So you'd have to read the biography that's in the book about my childhood experiences. Um, when I was eight, my mother died. So I stayed in five different foster homes in an orphanage. And all through this time, I'm trying to make this adjustment as to who I am and what I wanted to do in life. So I had three sisters. They were in another foster home, but they stayed in the same one until they became 18, as you would do in a in foster, foster home. home yeah. So I went through five different foster homes. So I'm in this search about who am I and uh, who are these people that I keep uh, having to, having to reestablish a home life right. with. And during the second foster home I was leaving, I'm sitting in the car with a social worker and I'm sitting on the hump in the back seat. I've got on shorts and when you go back 55 years and you're talking about- Oh, uh, I can sitting, imagine. You know, there's a lot of room in the back of, right. a, of, a, of a Buick and you're sitting oh, on wow. the hump and so my feet are on top of the hump and I'm wearing shorts and the seats are vinyl. So my legs near my knees are sticking- To the vinyl. To the vinyl, and I keep lifting them up because I'm, I'm getting clammy and I'm uncomfortable. Right. And I'm having this experience about like, where am I gonna go now? Mm-hmm. I have no idea and, and I'm having to tell myself, you're gonna have to suck it up. There was nobody there to, no one asked like, well, how do you feel about today? Are you oh, scared about leaving, leaving this place? So I had to do this mental adjustment to myself about you're going to have to find your inner strength and you're not going to have to be able to depend on someone else to comfort you. And I'm right. making this decision at 10 years old. At 10 years old? <laughs> can you, that's a lot for a 10 year old, 10 year old to try and, you know. Well, I didn't say I, I had of, resolved it. I just no, but told I mean myself to even think about that I was going to process that and try to adapt. And so art was an outlet and comedy was an outlet. So uh -huh. as a student in school, I was always trying to be entertaining. And now if I told myself, if I really wanted to look at another career, I'd want to be a comedy writer. <laughs> really? <laughs> because 
everyone has always said he thinks he's funny or he's always saying funny things. Don't laugh at his jokes. And this is what happens at the house. <laughs> don't do that. Don't encourage don't, him. Don't encourage him. <laughs> so uh, I always keep that in the back of my head because of what I know now, that would have been the career alternative if I didn't want to pursue becoming an artist. So figuring it out is where I'm taking myself from eight years old, then at 10 years old, and then at 19 years old, I'm in college, and then I found out my father, who moved to California when I was born, well, he died. And so then I have the revelation that this is not unusual. This happens to a lot of people that look like me. Okay. There's a lot of single uh, parent yeah, households, a lot. and there's a lot of I children in foster homes. I was a single parent household. My, my, my mom had three girls, right. so I know. So one of the things that happened, I was ex explaining this to, and telling my sister this. The, so I had three sisters, and one actually graduated from college. So Simone Biles was talking about the idea that she was in a foster home, but her, her grandparents adopted her. Oh, wow. So they became like her foster parents, I think is what the story was. So I Googled wh like what happened or how many foster children actually even go to college or graduate. Graduate. Three percent. That's all. Graduate from college. College, yes. And I said, well, and I told my sister because she graduated from college also. And I said, we are extraordinary in our experiences yes. because there's still the numbers, there's hundreds of thousands of children now that are still in foster home, and they didn't have the thing that we found in ourselves to push ourselves to go to college. Then we got married, we've had children. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be a dysfunctional <laughs> individual walking around the street. trying to, yep. to cover it up, but I haven't survived. I and think it's because you I, I don't, survive is not the word. I, I just felt like I was, uh, I was given a special gift. There you go. And that's what I was going to say. Being distracted the gift. Yes. To become an individual that wouldn't be uh, not not a useful person in society. I, it just I just could have chosen a different path, and I didn't do it. I had op opportunities to do it. Uh, there are days I could have jumped the fence and not gone to class one day. Mm -hmm. uh, there are days I was invited to not do this particular the thing. thing or, okay. And there's, there's always these things. And I just was, it wasn't that I thought I was smarter. I just endured a whole lot of uh, verbal abuse for not going along with the crowd. I just did that a lot. And, and I just said, well, I'll take comfort in creating my art. Oh. There you go. So figured it out when you bring it forward from eight years old with my mother dying and where I am now at 64. And I've understood that the people that I've drawn from who I see on the street, that could be, any one of those people I've drawn could have been me. Could have been you. It could have been me. So I, I could have been the person asking for money. From. Exactly. I, I could be the person asking for money. I could be the person on the street corner drawing portraits, trying to see if someone we'll buy would that. let me do it. Exactly. I could have been any one of those. Okay. Tell me about that. Which so, just... I don't remember her name. Maybe in a better moment I could think of it. <laughs> but I was at 12th Baptist Church for the uh -huh. funeral of uh, Michael E. Michael Haynes. Haynes? Okay. So I, I got there the early. That was the key to be able to sit in the uh, sanctuary. Yes. In the vestibule. So um, I was there maybe two hours before the funeral. And after I'd been there maybe 45 minutes, this woman came in. And so she's wearing a gray outfit from head to toe. So um, the hat that she had on with a bow was, it reminded me of the hat that Aretha Franklin wore when she sang in, at uh, 
for the Bill Clinton's inauguration. The, oh, okay. I remember that hat. So that hat went to the Smithsonian after the event. Then, yes. And so when I saw hers, I said, oh, she's doing the thing like Aretha Franklin. Right. And this is it. This is, <sighs> this is what I try to do when I do a drawing of a person is this is the person that defined Michael E. Haynes' funeral or memorial service. Service. Or uh, he called, it would have been his valedictory. Yes. <laughs> service. Yes, it would have been. And so the, um, um, I didn't ask her. There you go. But she was out in the area where it, it was all sort of there. The iron railing was behind her. But I knew the photo of Michael E. Haynes was actually on a lower level. Oh, yes. On a little stand. Stand. So I actually <laughs> moved that to where she is. Oh, you did. But literally the, the drawing of Martin Luther King was behind her. Yep. And so what I'm trying to do is give you that sense of the history of the church. Church. And Michael E. Haynes is looking up at her and at Martin Luther King, and it's telling this whole story of the three of them are doing this creative dance of saluting each other. Oh Whereas Michael E. Haynes is looking up to heaven or to King, and she is saying, as she's looking out, do you get this? Yes. <laughs> okay. That was amazing. That, I like that. And so you would almost have to be told the story uh, if you really looked at the the drawing, you may not understand who Michael E. Haynes is. A lot of people probably don't. Don't. And See, maybe don't. Martin Luther King wasn't drawn as well as he could have been to be somebody <laughs> totally recognizable. But if I explain it, it's enough you for people to say, say, I see what I you were trying, trying attempting to, to, do, to do anyway. Exactly. 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 But you know, all of your all of your photographs that all of your sketches that I've seen, you know, on in Facebook are like, wow. When I first saw them, I, I said to myself, I thought he was a photographer, not a sketch artist. And then I find that Anthony Lanier is a sketch artist. And I'm saying, wow. You, and then I realized you, and when I saw you and you told me, and when you, you told me about the book, and then I saw you talking about the book on Facebook, the, the picture of you on, on Facebook and with the book, and I'm saying, oh, he's doing a book on the sketches that he's done and, and the photography that he's, you know, that he's turned those sketches in, the photography that he's turned those sketches into. It was like amazing, you know. Well, thank you. Well, can I, I tell you another story? Tell me another story. I want to know. In the book. And my audience wants to know. I described that when I was eight years old, when my mother died. Yes. My sisters had the same experience. I just found this out not even a year ago. We were just having this conversation. So in the state of Kentucky, the foster care system is in the Department of Human Resources. Oh. So when my mother died, they sent me to a psychiatrist. I had no idea like Why what the experience was about. Okay. But I understood that this was a person who was studying how I thought and, and was trying to get a sense of my reaction to my mother's, mother's death. Yeah, mother's and death. I totally knew this. Oh, uh, see? So they were doing all these things, if you were a psychiatrist, that uh, tested you were given. given so I looked yes. at ink blots, the Rorschach mm, test. Uh, uh, I was given visual puzzles where they show you a picture and then you take wooden pieces with paint on them and match, match them to the picture. Pictures, and there was yep. a time limit to see how well you you could actually um, uh, put the put, the puzzle, the put it together. together. Right, exactly. Versus, I guess I a test those. of intelligence. So another thing that he did was he showed me black and white photos and he asked me what did I think when I looked at this photo? So one of the stories I, I absolutely remember is there was this uh, girl in the photo. She had on a dress. She had on lace uh, socks and what we call like dress buckle shoes. 
So I was telling an experience about, he says, well, what do you think is happening here? What, what, what's going on in her life? I said, oh, you, you're going to use this to try to dig into, like, what am I going to express about my mother's Mother. death? She's so an I said, I, know what I told doing. this great story, and I realized after I had gone to this <laughs> event, I said, you know what, Anthony? You are a storyteller. That's what you are. Yes. So I have the ability to take pictures. You know, other people them. take photos. I create stories. Stories. So whether I'm using a and camera, that's what you're, mm -hmm. but certainly when I'm doing a drawing, I am making stories. Stories. There's a story behind every image. There's a reason why I just so randomly take someone's photo. There's a reason why. And then once I put something into it, I craft sort of like a biography of what this picture is about. about. So if you ask me about any particular picture, you got five or ten minutes, an hour, I can sit and tell you <laughs> five or ten what minutes. I believe is and going then on. Tell me the story behind that, that picture. Life. Exactly. The, tell me the story behind that. Thanks. Okay, so this is a person who was at Pride. And this is possibly uh, the last public Boston Pride event that they had, which was probably four years ago, 2017. Was it still, or was it eight, or was it 18? I know they didn't do one in 20. I know they didn't do one didn't in, do one in 19. Was, right, it's a, maybe it was 2018. I think it was 18. Uh, and so when I go to Pride, I'm trying to be cosmopolitan in what I do. So pride has been dissolved. Yes. Because it did have issues about who they brought in. That's right. To organize it. Mm -hmm. I heard all <laughs> about so that one on the news. When I go to pride, I do have to look for the African-American male. Of course. And I'm trying to show that because I can find everybody else that I like. And you can randomly see even the black female. Okay. But to find the right image of the black, black male, male that fits my storyline, I do have to look for it. And so when I do have it, I want to have something that's defining. And he seemed to be the person he? that I wanted to show that he was positive and he was confident because he's giving you that like yep. Positive effect. Fit. And he and comes that, across as that. like the super figure because he's yes. got a cape. Yes. And so he's like the gay super figure that says, yes, I belong at this event. Yes, I can do the same things anybody else does. Yes, I fit into society. And yes, we should be accepted. And so I've, I've crafted all this and I'm trying to see if I can sell this to someone looking at this drawing the way I feel when I look at it. There you go. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up our conversation. Whoa. Yes, we are. And no, it's been a great conversation. I've learned a lot about you. I've learned a lot about how you put this book together. I learned about, definitely learned about what figured it out meant, because I, uh, I, that was the first thing that came across, what it, what it was about. So I want to thank my guest, Anthony Lanier, for coming on and being with me today. And I want to thank my, artists, my audience for being with us today. I am Elaine Hall Corbin, your host, and you have been with me today on Artists of Color. Thank you, and you will see us again in a couple of weeks, believe it or not. And have a great afternoon. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you.